I'm David Greenstein, Director of Public Programs for the Cooper Union, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the second in the John J. Islin Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, those of you who were here last week uh, heard a, an introduction by President Jamshed Baruchia, and I'm just going to welcome those who weren't here last week. There are a number of people who uh, couldn't make it, so I will very briefly uh, let you know about um, this series, which honors John J. Islin, the 10th president of the Cooper Union, uh, who had a very distinguished career in uh, journalism, in publishing, and public television before becoming president of the Cooper Union. He was uh, national affairs editor of Newsweek, uh, trade book editor at Harper and Row, and then from 1973 to 1987, he was president of Channel 13, and he made the nation's largest public television station into its most innovative. While he was president of Cooper Union from 1988 to 2000, he completed a $50 million capital campaign, created endowed professorships, um, and added new trustees and new deans strengthened the school considerably. Uh, this year's tribute to Jay Islin is a series of 10 lectures on the United States Constitution by Bert Newborn, the Inez Milholland Professor of Civil Liberties at NYU Law School, and the founding legal director of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU. For 45 years, he's been one of the country's leading civil liberties lawyers serving as National Legal Director of the ACLU, Special Counsel to the National Organization for Women Legal Defense Fund, and a member of the New York City Human Rights Commission. And he's argued many uh, Supreme Court cases and litigated hundreds of important constitutional cases in state and federal courts. Tonight, Professor Newborn will speak about democracy and the Constitution a dysfunctional democracy built by judges. Professor Newman. Thank you, David. Um, and uh, thanks for coming back. Um, it's always a relief to have an audience on the second night. Uh, um, and thanks again to uh, Lee Islin uh, for sponsoring this uh, lectures um, in uh, memory of her husband, Jay. Um, in lecture one, um, I argued that Republican and Democratic justices would tend to decide hard constitutional cases differently, using characteristically different value hierarchies primarily involving the relative importance of autonomy and equality and the relative importance of stability and change. Now, as I, as I, may, as I may try to make clear uh, in the first lecture, it's not that they don't all share those values. They all care deeply about the same values. Uh, but there will be cases in which you can't have them all and you have to choose. Uh, and in making the choice, I predicted that Republican judges, Republican justices, in deciding hard cases would tend to privilege autonomy and stability and order, while democratic justices would tend to privilege equality, popular sovereignty, and change. I argued as well um, that there were large numbers of cases that would fall under what I called the consensus constitution, where clear text and binding precedent would provide the justices with external guidance that overrides their individual values. Now, I want to try to begin in this lecture, the second lecture, to sketch out the actual content of the three constitutions. Next week in lecture three, I'll try to sketch the three free speech clauses. Lecture four will deal with the three religious freedom clauses. This week, I'll ask how the Republican and Democratic constitutions have shaped and defined American democracy. And I want to warn you in advance, it is not a pretty story. Um, democracy has always been beset uh, by an internal contradiction. The ethos of democracy 
calls for the equal exercise of political power by self-governing citizens. But the practice of democracy in virtually every culture has been to generate electorates that exclude the weak and reinforce the strong. Indeed, until relatively recently, democracy has been as much about the exclusion of the weak as it has been about the empowerment of the people. Athenians invented democracy, but they parceled out the vote to just a fraction of the electorate, excluding women, slaves, and resident aliens. The Italian and Swiss city-states popularized democracy, but were really functioning as government by merchant princes. Um, Great Britain proved that mass democracy could work, but even Great Britain didn't embrace uni universal suffrage until 1884, and even then denied the vote to women. Not surprisingly, uh, 18th, century, 18th century American democracy, the democracy that is reflected in the text of the 1787 Constitution, began by denying the vote to the weak. The Constitution, the federal Constitution, the 1787 Constitution, says absolutely nothing about voting or about running for office. Uh, those were powers that were left to the states, and the states exercised those powers by excluding women, excluding people of color, and the poor from the ballot. Much of the history of democracy in the United States involves efforts to expand that very small, original, formal electorate. For example, the 15th Amendment sought to end racial obstacles to voting. The 19th Amendment guaranteed the vote to women. The 24th Amendment ended poll taxes in federal elections. The 26th Amendment extended the vote to 18-year-olds in federal elections. Beginning in 1962, a blizzard of Supreme Court decisions that lasted for about 10 years under a democratic constitution, now part of the consensus constitution, wiped out property qualifications for voting, ended durational residence requirements, and invalid mal inval invalidated malapportioned legislatures. In 1975, Congress banned literacy tests in all elections. Vigorous enforcement of the Voting Rights Act of 1982 finally alleviated the shameful de facto exclusion of racial minorities from the electorates of many states. By 2000, with the very important exception of ex-felons in a number of states, and the perennial problem of how to deal fairly with permanent resident aliens, uh, the formally defined American electorate embraced all of the governed with no islands of exclusion. And yet, today, in 2012's version of American democracy, the age-old contradiction between democracy's inclusionary aspiration and its exclusionary reality continues. Viewed realistically, American democracy today is divided into three tiers. The top tier consists of one to two percent of the population functioning as what I call super citizens. Super citizens from both parties set the national agenda, select the candidates, bankroll the election campaigns, and enjoy privileged access to officials both before and after the election, to say nothing about influencing their actions and votes. Now, membership in the top tier is not defined by law, nor is it confined to the wealthy. It's possible to function as a super citizen on the basis of talent, good looks, fame, family, sa family status, or sheer persistence. But money gets you in the door with no questions asked. Um, a second tier, ordinary citizens, made up of the rest of us, uh, the 50 to 60 percent of the population that votes. Ordinary citizens like us choose between and among the alternatives made available to us by super citizens, often on the basis of political advertising sponsored by those super citizens. Now, if the options are real, as they are in the coming election, uh, ordinary citizens like us exercise real power. The third tier is made up of what I call spectator citizens. Spectator citizens are the 40 to 50 percent of the population that does not vote. Spectator citizens tend to cluster at the low end of the educational and economic ladder, and in American society today are disproportionately black and Hispanic. The persistence 
of the existence of an elite first tier and the persistence of a disproportionately poor, non-participating third tier produces a reality in our political life in which a small economic elite, super citizens, interact with a relatively large second tier of comfortable and well-educated voters to produce a form of popular governance that enhances the power of the rich and excludes the poor from exercising significant political power. Now, a century ago, political participation was rationed by formally denying the vote to women, to people of color, to the poor, and to newcomers. Today, it is rationed by our system of campaign finance, by our system of voter registration, by our system of electoral administration that produces a system that overrepresents the rich and dramatically reduces the political power of the bottom economic, educational, and economic quarter of the voting population. And defenders of the current system say that once the formal impediments to voting were removed, um, the existence of the three tiers is just the natural result of a series of individual choices made by people reflecting differences in preference, ability, and relative sophistication. But a three-tier democracy like ours is neither a, na a natural inevitability, a genuine reflection of preferences, or a constitutional given. The first and third tiers are legal constructs. They are the predictable consequences of a series of decisions about how to structure American democracy that have been upheld under the Republican Constitution, but would probably violate the Democratic Constitution. So in 2012, after 100 years of struggling to eliminate formal impediments to voting, we have a democracy in which 60% of the population votes. The highest vote turnout in the 20th century was 61% for presidential election. We get positively giddy if we can count all the votes. Um, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, our system of um, uh, campaign finance virtually turns much of the election over to the wealthy. Um, the two political parties engage in massive gerrymandering that enhances their, unfairly enhances their relative political power in areas that they control, um, and really has rendered uh, contested elections in most House um, and legislative areas a, uh, uh, an endangered species. It, it, it's remarkable that of a uh, House of Representatives with 435 members of Congress in an ordinary election, about 35 seats are contestable in real elections. In this one, it may be a little bit more, um, uh, but it never reaches 100. So you never have an election in which a quarter of the House actually has to run for re-election. They know that they can't lose because the, the lines have been drawn to make it impossible for them to lose. Now, how did we get to this place? How did we get to a place where after working so hard to try to establish a functioning democracy, uh, we wind up with something as disappointing as the democracy that we seem to be dealing with today? Uh, the story begins, I think, 50 years ago, in 1962, in a conversation between three iconic Supreme Court justices. that I, It's a fictional conversation, but it occurs uh, in their various opinions, and I'm just going to paraphrase what they've said in their opinions. Um, it, it opens in 1962 in a, in a very famous case called Baker versus Carr, which is the one person, one vote case. Um, but for our purposes, it's even more important. It's the first case in which the Supreme Court confronted the question of whether American judges were going to be given a major role in the structuring of American democracy. Until then, the courts had stayed out. Um, uh, and in Baker versus Carr was the first time that they were bringing the courts in to play a significant role um, in the construction of American democracy. So the first person to open up, as he was in every meeting in which he ever attended, was Felix Frankfurter. Um, uh, so Felix Frankfurter, uh, a brilliant, brilliant um, a jurist um, and a strong left-wing political figure. Um, he, was, uh, he was the political lieutenant uh, of Louis Brandeis uh, when Brandeis sat on the Supreme Court, uh, and Frankfurter uh, was a confidant of Roosevelt, 
uh, a Roosevelt appointee, um, and was one of the um, major uh, uh, architects of much of the effort at imposing regulation on the market uh, during the first um, uh, third of the 20th century. So Frankfurter um, opens up and says, are you crazy? You don't want to let judges have anything to do with the bit, with the construction of American democracy. What do judges know about democracy? Uh, what a ju um, how uh, how will they decide what a good democracy um, is and what a good and and what a bad democracy is? Um, there's nothing in the constitutional text that talks about voting or running for office or democracy. It's an embarrassing hole because the text is uh, 1787 and people didn't really care much about who voted and ran for office in those days. So the text doesn't have much. Um, so he said, where would judges get the power to shape and the wisdom to shape American democracy? He said, and, and this is, a, fa this is a, a quote, you will rue the day that you turn the shaping of American democracy over to judges. Um, Brennan scoffed at him. William Brennan scoffed at him. Uh, Brennan said, uh, Felix, I understand what your position is, uh, but you're just wrong. I do agree with you. There's nothing in the Constitution. There's no text in the Constitution that a judge can cleave to and say, this is the right to vote, this is the right to run for office. Um, it is a hole in the Constitution, and it is embarrassing. But there is stuff in the Constitution I can use. How about equality? I can use the equality provisions of the Constitution. I can use maybe some other provisions of the Constitution. I can piece together some text. And from the text, I can get authority for American judges to shape the Constitution. Frankfurter said, you're nuts. Without, without really strong textual guidance, don't trust the judges. Brennan said, no, I can trust the judges because I'll be able to use a strong equality argument that will both authorize them and tether them and limit them. They'll, they'll, they'll be forced to stay inside the equality text. At the very end of the discussion, Harlan pipes up. Uh, John Marshall Harlan is the third one in this discussion. And Harlan says to, the two, to, to Brennan, be careful what you wish for. Because you can get a democracy that's perfectly equal, but terribly undemocratic. Um, and of course, as we'll see when we talk about Bush versus Gore in a couple of minutes, that's exactly what we got. Um, Bush versus Gore is a case in which the Supreme Court insisted on absolute equality norms in Florida um, and wound up simply eliminating the election because they couldn't be met. Um, so Harlan said, be careful. You, uh, you, you're, you're making a mistake if you pin um, everything to equality. Now, faithfully at that point, Brennan chose not to engage with Frankfurter. Brennan could have said to Frankfurter, what are you talking about? Judges do perfectly well creating federalism rules, separation of powers rules. We do very well, even though there's no separation of powers clause in the Constitution, even though there's no federalism power in the Constitution. That's a, they're, they're important implied um, uh, um, uh, aspects of the Constitution that have to be judicially developed. We could have democracy as the third of those um, important pillars of the Constitution, and we can trust the judges to build good democracy, um, uh, recognizing that there is a core, that good democracy is robust, equal access in democratic self-governance um, by a free people. We can do that, and there's no reason why they can't work that out. Um, uh, but he didn't do it. He backed away because he was afraid he didn't have the votes. And so instead, in a fateful decision, which is haunting us today, he locked the judicial protection of American democracy into finding some sort of textual um, basis for, en for entering the case that has nothing to do with good or bad democracy. So that what we've wound up with now for 50 years is American judges, Republicans and Democrats, approaching hard democracy cases and deciding them as equality cases, deciding them as separation of powers cases, deciding them as First Amendment cases, uh, free speech cases, deciding them as freedom of association cases, um, and differing about Democratic and Republican doctrine in all of those cases, but not once, never, because they're not allowed to ask the question, do they ask, is this good for democracy or bad for democracy? So what we wind up doing is having them connect the dots um, without having any sense of what picture they're building.
Um, and it is, I believe, we now live in 2012 in an accidental democracy that has been built by judges deciding doctrinal cases, maybe right, maybe wrong, but there never is a teacher in the room saying, are you guys sure that this is good for democracy or bad for democracy? They don't ask the question. And so we wind up with a whole host of cases that may be right or that may be wrong. We can, we can disagree about whether we, we think they're good doctrine or bad doctrine, um, but we never ask, are they good democracy or bad democracy? Um, and until we find a way to bring democracy back into the uh, equation, I think we're going to suffer from, from this same accidental lurching back and forth. Let's take a look at some real, at some real cases. The first decade of the 21st century opened and closed with three bitterly contested cases shaping American democracy that provide both a snapshot of how the Republican and Democratic constitutions operate to shape democracy and the price of not asking whether something is good or bad for democracy, but just deciding it under legal doctrine without democracy entering the picture. First one is Bush v. Gore. In Bush v. Gore, five Republican justices prevented Florida from completing the recount of the deciding votes in the 2000 presidential elections, judicially awarding the election to George Bush. The four Democratic justices dissented. In Crawford versus Marion County, five Republican justices joined this time by a sixth justice, Justice Stevens, who is a formal Republican, uh, but he admitted that he was rooting for Harry Truman over um, uh, Thomas Dewey uh, when he was a kid, so I have him down as an honorary Democrat. Uh, um, um, five Republican justices plus Stevens upheld an Indiana statute requiring the presentation of a, vote, of a photo ID to vote, despite the disproportionate impact of the new regulation on the poor, because they have much more trouble getting the photo IDs than the rest of us do. We all have driver's licenses. Um, um, and the lack of a showing that fraud was a real problem um, in Indiana elections. The three Democratic justices dissented. And then finally, in Citizens United, versus the Federal Elections Commission, five Republican justices voted that for-profit business corporations enjoy a First Amendment right to spend unlimited sums in order to influence an election. The four Democratic justices dissented. And you're not going to get a better snapshot of the difference between the Republican and Democratic Constitution than those three cases. Now, none of the three cases was easy. Bush v. Gore, um, you can you know you can talk about Bush v. Gore and and uh, excoriate the Republican justices for exercising partisan um, uh, activity that they were really just trying to get the Republican president uh, elected. Um, I reject that. I reject it one because it is utterly destructive of the process. Once that once that infects the process, you can forget about using courts in any kind of constructive way. You just you just do to courts what we've done to virtually every other part of American political life and make them uninhabitable by civilized people. Um, um, uh, so uh, so I am not going down. I am not going down the line of of yelling uh, of partisan epithets back and forth. Um, um, there's a principled putting the best face on Bush versus Gore, it, there's a principled uh, uh, aspect to the decision. Um, none of the cases, as I say, Bush versus Gore dealt with a chaotic recount uh, process where different standards were being used in different Florida counties to decide whether a particular ballot could be counted or not. Now, once the process was deemed too chaotic and therefore too unequal, uh, to satisfy the equality norms in the Constitution, which guarantee all voters an equal opportunity to vote, um, um, the five Republicans, joined this time by two Democrats, said, um, uh, you can't go forward with the recount uh, under these terms because the recount is, is simply um, a, 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 a unfolding pursuant to unequal norms, which we just can't, we can't abide. Um, at that point, they had a choice. They could send the case back to Florida, with instructions to the Florida judges to clean up their act and get a single um, uh, standard that would be equally applicable throughout the state so that equality norms would be satisfied. Everybody would be judged by the same standard. Um, um, or they could terminate the recount 
um, and simply say that the person who had been named the winner, George Bush, by the, uh, sec by the Florida Secretary of State, is to be designated the winner, and the electoral votes go to Bush. Now, continuing the recount would have meant that Florida would miss what is called the safe harbor provisions. The safe harbor provisions of the Electoral College and our presidential election system say that as long as a state reports its electoral votes to Congress by a certain date, Congress may not question the validity of the uh, of the uh, support, uh, so that if, if, uh, if uh, all the states rush to make sure that their electoral um, uh, college uh, uh, reports are given to Congress by the safe harbor date, um, so that they don't have to worry about somebody politically trying to peel uh, the electoral votes off um, in Congress. Uh, and the safe harbor was put in as a result of the chaotic 1876 election uh, when Hayes ran against Tilden. Tilden won the popular vote, but there was no safe harbor or anything like that. And so what, um, what the Hayes people did, because they had control of Congress, is they challenged 20 electors that were pledged to Tilden. They knocked out the 20 electors pledged to Tilden and announced that they were seating 20 electors pledged to, to uh, Hayes. Hayes won in the Electoral College 185 to 184, even though Tilden carried well over 52% of the popular vote. Um, now, to stop that from ever happening again, you've got these safe harbor provisions. Now, the, the recount had gone on so long, in part because the Supreme Court kept intervening and stopping it, but the recount had gone on so long that if they remanded back to Florida, the, um, the safe harbor date couldn't have been met. They couldn't finish the recount by the safe harbor date, which meant that when Florida finally reported um, its electors to, to Congress. They could have been challenged and questioned in Congress, and there would have been a chaotic fight in Congress over which set of electors to, to be seated. Um, um, and there's no telling what would have happened in that chaotic fight. Um, it might be that Florida would have simply been disenfranchised and they wouldn't have counted any Florida electors. Um, or it might be that the Bush electors were seated, or it might be that the, um, uh, that, uh, the Gore electors were seated, but it would have been a bloody political fight on the floor of, of the House. Um, the Republican justices predictably, predictably, faced with that kind of chaos, especially faced with that kind of chaos in electing a president of the United States um, whose very existence is a stable anchor for a whole worldwide set of security um, concerns. Um, so um, if there's doubt about who the president of the United States is, um, the whole world shudders. Um, so faced with that kind of risk, they did what Republican justices always do. They voted for order, they voted for stability, and they voted and they terminated the recount, saying we just can't go down that road. Um, the Democratic, uh, the four Democrats, um, did what Democratic justices always do. And they said, no, we, 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 will, we are going to go down the popular sovereignty road. We're going to say that dem democracy and popular sovereignty is so important that it's worth taking the risk that the House won't know what to do. Uh, and will act badly. And they said, we can't assume that the House is going to act improperly just because the safe harbor date is passed. And um, just because of a fear that they're going to act improperly, we're not going to essentially um, disenfranchise all the people um, in, the, um, in the recount and have a, uh, uh, an election that, would, uh, uh, that is not really an election. It's, judi it's a judicial coronation. So that's Bush v. Gore, a hard case with the Democratic and Republican justices uh, reacting exactly as you would predict uh, based upon the assumptions about their value orientation. Um, Crawford, which is the Indiana uh, ID case. Now Crawford asks the justices to second guess a legislature's judgment about how to prevent electoral fraud. Um, um, now, I have my own suspicions about why the Indiana statute was passed, but I can't prove it. Um, on its face, it is simply a device to attempt to prevent electoral fraud by making sure that everybody shows a voter ID. Um, and the Republican justices predictably voted for order and risk, and risk aversion. They said, look, if there's a risk of fraud, let's, let's, uh, let's avoid it. Um, even though the price of avoiding it would be disproportionately disenfranchising some poor people who would have trouble getting the photo ID. 
The Democratic dissenters opted for popular sovereignty, despite the fact that they acknowledged that they were taking a risk. Um, but they said popular sovereignty is so important that we vote for it instead of order and stability. Now, Citizens United asked the court to decide whether a corporation possesses First Amendment rights um, in the context of a contested election. Now, viewed through the prism of increasing the sheer volume of speech that is available to hearers during an election, um, uh, the case tilts toward the First Amendment because it, you wind up with more speech, and more speech is good uh, from a First Amendment perspective. Viewed through the prism of minimizing the capacity of wealth to skew outcomes, uh, the decision is a disaster, and it, uh, and it tilts away from the First Amendment. Predictably, the Republican justices, the five Republican justices, opted for autonomy um, that would result in an increased volume of speech. The four Democratic justices opted for regulation in an effort to minimize wealth-driven electoral inequality. So that you can see in the three cases, you actually see Republican and Democratic constitutional doctrine right up next to each other being applied to the same fact pattern with the Republican justices voting one way and the Democratic justices voting the other. And the only break in those three cases is Stevens moving over to the uh, Republican majority um, in, the, uh, uh, in the Indiana case. Otherwise, it's right down the line, uh, Republican and Democrat. But one thing I urge you to think about is that in none of those cases did a single justice, Republican or Democrat, actively say, is this good for democracy or is this bad for democracy? Instead, they, they, decide, they, they argued about doctrine and they went back and forth about what doctrine would be, but they didn't say, wait a minute, we're constructing a democracy here. Let's, let's, not, let's, not, let's not lose the full picture. Now, when you look at those cases through a democracy prism, not through an equality prism, not through a First Amendment prism, not through the prisms of the doctrine in the Constitution that, that um, Brennan's fateful decision in 1962 locks us into. Um, if you look at it instead from the perspective, is, is it good for democracy or bad for democracy, those three cases are demo, ju, ju, they're judicially constructed democratic disasters. Um, Bush v. Gore involves a judicially imposed president. From a democracy standpoint, it can't get worse. There's nothing worse. It's the worst possible outcome. Crawford invites cynics to marginalize weak voters by pretending to be concerned with the proper functioning of democracy. So again, it's a body blow to democracy by not vigorously uh, enforcing the right of people to vote um, um, in the teeth of suspect um, efforts uh, to prevent them disguised as neutral uh, regulations of the electorate. And then finally, Citizens United just completes a process that was begun in 1976 in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo, which we'll talk about, um, that simply turns the entire, uh, uh, turns our democracy over to the rich and simply says that uh, uh, we're going to be dominated uh, by people with vast amounts of money, and they're going to dominate the election. So after all this time, if you think about those three cases as just a snapshot, you see how, we, how we've gotten ourselves into a position where a judicially constructed democracy um, is, is maybe perfectly good law. I could teach it in, uh, in, uh, up the street at NYU as First Amendment law, as equality law. The one thing I can't teach it as is democracy law because it's terrible democracy and judges have built it. So this is a snapshot. Stay with me for a couple of minutes and we'll take an x-ray. I want to go a little deeper uh, into the system and, and, and talk to you about the various ways that this, this way of approaching democracy, that I call doctrine without democracy, uh, the way, the way the, this ver these various ways of approaching democracy um, has essentially played out and, sh and shaped every piece of our democratic structure. Now, the health of any judicially built democratic democracy um, it turns on, on measuring five lines of cases. One line of cases that will define the eligible electorate, another line of cases that will deal with problems to pre uh, with, with efforts to prevent weak and marginalized eligible voters from voting, a third line of cases that actually talks about how you administer and structure 
the elect the the uh, an election and the democratic process. A fourth line of cases that will say, can you attack? Power centers, or, or are, the, um, are the polls essentially immune from being attacked by people who think that they're leading us in the wrong direction? And finally, how do you finance your democracy? Those are, those are the five questions. Um, who's the eligible voter? Is it easy to knock the eligible voters out? How are our elections actually administered? What kind of political power do the polls have as opposed to the people? Uh, and how is the, how is the uh, 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 process actually funded? Um, in the, uh, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use, I'm going to use the NYU grading system for this. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to grade what the courts have done, um, and use the uh, grading, the grading system to tell you. The, uh, it, um, in defining the eligible electorate, the courts get an A minus. They get an A minus uh, because in the 10 years after. Brennan invented this uh, in Baker versus Carr, there was an explosion of judicial activity that used equality as a way of deciding who could vote. And it's a very simple, uh, 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 very simple process. What Brennan said is if one person can vote, then everybody else has to be allowed to vote. And if you won't let them vote, you better have a damn good reason why. So, so what he winds up doing is unleashing the courts on all of the voting restrictions and saying to the various government entities, tell us why you're not letting this group of people vote. Tell us why you're not letting this group of people vote. And over a 10-year period, um, virtu the, the, uh, virtually all of the restrictions for voting get swept away. Durational residence requirements get swept away. Property qualifications for voting get swept away. Poll taxes get swept away. The inability of third parties to get on the ballot gets swept away. So in a 10-year period, the actual definition of the electorate um, went from relatively low to relatively high, and judges did it. And that's what Brennan was hoping would happen. That's what he, that's what he was telling Frankfurter uh, was going to happen, except for one group of voters ex-felons. Ex-felons had the misfortune to have their case heard by the Supreme Court in 1974, two years after the Republicans got a majority. If it had been heard during the 60s, I have no doubt that we would not be talking about an ex-felon problem now. Uh, that denying them the vote after they get out of, uh, serve, their, uh, serve their prison time and go back into the community would have been viewed an unconstitutional impediment to the vote, um, uh, that why should they not be allowed to vote when everybody else can? Um, and um, it would have been knocked out in a minute. But in 1974, the Republicans are in charge, and they do something extraordinary. They say the 14th Amendment is not just about the first clause of the 14th Amendment, which talks about equality and talks about um, a due process of law, um, there's a second clause in the 14th Amendment. And the second clause in the 14th Amendment was inserted, 14th Amendment is 1868. The 14th Amendment was inserted, uh, uh, the second clause was inserted because they didn't think they had the votes to get the 15th Amendment ratified. So they didn't think they were going to be able to get an amendment uh, 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 guaranteeing the vote without regard to race ratified. So instead, they stuck into the 14th Amendment a blackmail provision that was designed to blackmail the South into letting black people vote by saying that your apportionment in the Senate, in the House, the apportionment of House seats would be based not on raw population, but on voting population. So if you kept people out, uh, if you kept people from voting, um, then you would lose House members. So the assumption was that the Southerners would want to have representation in the House, and therefore they would allow uh, larger numbers of black people to vote. Um, there was one exception to it. They said, except if you're dealing with people convicted of rebellion, this is 1868, of rebellion or other crime, if you don't let them vote, we're not going to penalize you. We're not going to penalize you. You can still get representation there. Um, but this is a device uh, that's designed to enhance the power of black voters. In, a, in one of the real ironies of recent times, what the Republican Supreme Court did is they said, well, wait a minute. They said that uh, you wouldn't be penalized if you were convicted of rebellion or other crimes. That's clear as to me, as the nose on my face, that rebellion and other crimes meant rebellion in the Civil War and other crimes associated with the, with the Civil War. Um, but the Supreme Court lopped off 
other crimes and said, no, no, this is an authorization to states not to let felons vote, ex-felons vote. Um, and um, it therefore trumps the, the equality argument that you would have been able to make in the first um, uh, clause. And that's the law today. That's still the law today. That's why ex-felons can't vote. Um, um, and, uh, in many states now, we've made tremendous progress in erasing that. But for example, Florida, where, where the bite is really, Florida and Virginia are the two places where the bite is the, the heaviest. In Florida, the, op the operation of the felon disenfranchisement statute is estimated to disenfranchise 25% of the black male population. And undoubtedly was the reason why Bush carried Florida in 2000 and not Gore. Um, um, and it's still in place. So that's, the, that's why I would give it an A except for that. Uh, but the A minus, uh, 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 they did a pretty good job. Every, everything else worked out well. Felon disenfranchisement is still waiting to be fixed. The second um, uh, line of cases, well, suppose you have a, uh, a, a good eligible electorate. Um, are there ways to make, you know, make them not vote? Are there ways that somebody is going, to be, is going to sneak around behind them and prevent them from voting? And the unfortunate answer to that is the courts only get a C on that, and maybe a C minus. Because what they've held is, if you can prove that somebody is purposely preventing you from voting, why then, of course, we'll stop him. Um, but you have to prove that it's purposeful. It's not enough that it had a disparate uh, impact. It's not enough um, uh, that the guy knew in advance that these regulations were going to prevent certain people from voting. And it's not even enough that he doesn't have much of a reason for passing the regulations. Um, um, if you can't prove purpose, then you're, you're out. And that's, that explains Crawford. In Crawford, they couldn't disprove, with a straight face, the Indiana legislatures stood up and said, this is not about keeping poor people from voting. This is about preventing fraud. We do not have a bad intent. We have a good intent. And there's no way to disprove it. There's no way to disprove it. Um, um, a, a quick story. Um, after the barn door was closed in Florida in the 2000 election, I do what I usually do, which is to bestir myself to deal with closed barn doors when it's too late. Um, so we went down to Florida to challenge the Florida um, felon disenfranchisement statute. The Brennan Center sent a team of lawyers to Florida to try to challenge the uh, felon disenfranchisement statute to at least stop it from messing up future elections. Um, and our argument was, this is intentional. Our argument was, um, the Supreme Court has recognized that if you use the felon disenfranchisement statute intentionally to keep black people from voting, because they will be a dis disproportionately high percentage of people who become um, enmeshed in the criminal justice system. If you use that um, it, as, a, as a way to keep black people from voting, then it violates the Constitution. And the Supreme Court has said that. That's consistent with, uh, with this usual rule that says, if you can prove bad purpose, we'll help you. Um, so we went down and said, oh, this is a bad purpose. It's clear. Because the original felon disenfranchisement statute was enacted in 1868 as part of the Florida Constitution when Florida re-entered the Union. And it's clear that everybody agrees it was put in place so that Florida could enter the Union, ratify the 14th Amendment, and still keep black people from voting. Um, and so it, and it had that effect. It had a tremendously disproportionate effect. Um, in 1974, Florida uh, enacts a new constitution. And the new constitution reenacts the felon disenfranchisement language word for word. They don't say why, they just reenact the felon disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement language word for word. So we challenged it in a federal court in Florida and said, look, they've simply reenacted a racist provision um, and they shouldn't be able to launder it by just reenacting it word for word in a new constitution. I said, at a minimum, they should have to prove that they didn't have a bad purpose. Now, of course, this is in 2000 and I don't know, six or 2005, when everybody connected with the 1974 Constitution was long dead. So you're not going to be able to prove purpose or, or lack of purpose. The evidence is all gone. They were too smart to say anything about what they were doing. Um, um, so there's just great silence where you would think that there might be some evidence. And the federal judge said, what do you want from me? He said, the Supreme Court says it's your burden to prove purpose. You have to prove purpose. If you can't prove purpose, uh, you lose. And we lost.
Um, uh, and that's what happens over and over again when challenges are made to restrictions that have the effect of people, uh, uh, keeping people from voting. Um, but, but, but you have to prove purpose. Uh, now, the Voting Rights Act can help you under certain circumstances, but we couldn't use the Voting Rights Act in, in, in the Florida case. So that's the second, and that gets to C minus. That's just, uh, it's great for purpose, but proving purpose is brutally difficult um, and um, uh, uh, almost impossible to do. The third one is administering the election. How do we do with administering elections? Here, uh, if anything, it's worse. Here, it's a clear C, C minus, maybe a D. Um, 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 two, uh, uh, two examples, or, or, or one really a big one. Um, when Baker versus Carr was decided in 1962, it required that all legislative districts be equipopulous, that, that there be a one person, one vote, that you have the same number of people in all legislative districts. And that meant that you had to re redraw the districts every 10 years to keep up with the census, because the census is changing and you have to keep redrawing your districts uh, in order to deal with, with the census. Well, the politicians I immediately realized they were onto something terrific. If they were oblig obligated to redraw the districts every 10 years, they all decided to worship at the Church of Our Lady of, Perp of Perpetual Reapportionment. Um, uh, and Our Lady of Perpetual Reapportionment said what they did is keep moving the lines. They kept moving the lines year after year to make sure they couldn't lose. Um, and the lines kept getting drawn, and they had the same number of people in the districts. The only difference was by the time they were done, um, you knew who was going to win because they had, re they, had, they had gerrymandered the districts in a partisan way so that incumbents always win and the partisan advantage uh, is always the case. Think about this. New York State is a great example of it. New York State is a state that has swung Republican and Democrat during all of our lives. Republicans have had good years in, this, in the state. Democrats have had good years in the state. Since 1946, the House, the, uh, the, the Assembly up in Albany, has always been controlled by Democrats. No matter how strong the Republican surge is, no matter how um, significant, it's always been controlled by Democrats because they always jigger the lines every year to make sure that, the Demo that enough Democrats win so that they get control of the House, um, the, of the Assembly. The Senate, the upper house, has always been Republican. It was one year when it was, a couple of months and one year when it wasn't. Um, but, it's, but since 1946, no matter how strong the Democratic surge is, there's always a Republican house. It could not happen randomly. It could not happen randomly. They are carefully drawing the districts, and when you go to court to challenge it, and this is, the, this is the, where they get the D, the judges say, well, I, I, there's nothing we can do for you. Um, how do we know what fair means? And they essentially echo Frankfurter uh, in Baker versus Carr. They say, how do we know what fair means? We don't know what fair means. We, we're not in a position to help redraw the lines. Um, as long as it's one person, one vote, that's all you need, leaving the politicians free to literally eliminate contested elections from American legislative life. I mean, we have, in effect, reinvented a, um, um, democracy without elections. Uh, the Athenians did it first. I mean, the Athenians didn't have elections. They chose their officials by lot. They would just, you know, you would pull stuff out of a bag, uh, you know, out of a jar, um, and they would then become the officials. We don't choose our uh, officials by lot. We let our political leaders choose our officials for us and then draw the line so that it can't be challenged. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, maybe we should bring back Athenian democracy. And maybe we'd do better if we did it by randomly by lot. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the fourth one is power centers. I'll give you one example of what we've done with power centers. In the 19th century, we had a vibrant third party culture in the United States. The two major parties were constantly being, ch being challenged by third parties. Um, um, Lincoln himself um, was, uh, uh, was, uh, was originally a third party uh, candidate. So there was a constant challenging of the two major parties by a strong and vibrant third party movement. Um, and the third party movement was essentially fueled by one technique. It was called cross endorsements. So what, a, what, what you could do is you could have a small third party that would endorse the, one of the candidates of the major party, throw, throw the support of the small party to the candidate of the major party. The major party candidate would then get the benefit of those votes 
Um, and sometimes those votes were enough to put them over the top. And when those votes were enough to put them over the top, the minor party could then negotiate with the major party to put the stuff that they cared about into the major party platform and sometimes actually get absorbed into the major party where the major party would actually change and sometimes supplant the major party. Um, uh, but they would, get their, they would get their traction, they would get their start by being able to cross endorse. Because that meant that if you wanted to, to support that party, you didn't have to cast a protest vote. Um, you weren't throwing out your chance to have any say in the election. You could have a say in the election by voting for one of the major parties, but also signal your support for the minor party by voting for the minor party on the minor party line. Um, in the first 10 years of the 20th century, 41 states barred cross endorsements and put an end, put an end to the vibrant third party culture that existed in the United States. Um, um, it's still against the law in 41 states to cross endorse. Even though the candidate wants to accept the endorsement and the party wants to give the endorsement. Um, and the Supreme Court upheld it in a case called Timmons in 1988 and they upheld it in a classic Republican Democratic split. The majority justices said, look, this is all about stability. This is all about making sure that the two-party system isn't, um, um, uh, uh, it doesn't get unhinged by a lot of these minor parties that will drift into chaos and um, all of a sudden will become Italy. Um, uh, uh, so uh, we, we can't do that. So we have to maintain a two-party system and therefore the state can lock the two-party system in by making it difficult for the third parties uh, to, to, to contest. Um, again, if you look at it through a, dem a democracy perspective, what could be worse than to license the two parties to run a duopoly where you can't effectively challenge them? And the Supreme Court even rejected the constitutional right to cast a write-in vote. M most states let you cast a write-in vote. Some states don't. And when that was challenged, the Supreme Court said, no, no, no power to cast a write-in vote because, after all, um, um, uh, they, the, 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 the uh, uh, states should have the power to make sure that it's an orderly election. And if they want to funnel all the votes to the uh, major parties or to the people on the ballot, they can do that. Now, I've suggested to you that those, you know, that, the, you know, that, that, um, defining the electorate, the states did pretty well. Protecting, uh, the court did pretty well. Protecting the electorate, they haven't done very well. Um, running elections, um, they've allowed gerrymandering to go virtually un, uh, unchallenged um, in the country. Um, and uh, uh, um, locking a two-party duopoly in um, has been a very serious problem. Now, under a democratic constitution, much of that would change. Not all of it, much of it would change. But they still wouldn't be asking anything about is it a good democracy or a bad democracy. That still would not be part of the equation, and it must be made part of the equation. But if they, but if if they, you know, if I give, if, if you get an A minus on the first one, and various grades of C in the second, third, and fourth one, what do you get in the fifth one for um, structuring how we finance democracy? Um, I'm going to say that if someone, if, if an enemy agent infiltrated this country and said, how can I define a system that would weaken democracy in the most, uh, in, in, in the most effective way, he couldn't have done better than the Supreme Court has done in a series of cases setting up how we finance our democracy. The mistake they started in, in a case back in 1976, Buckley versus Vallejo, which is a 1976 case. Don't let anybody tell you that Citizens United is the bad case. Citizens United is bad enough to let corporations pour their money into elections makes a bad system worse. But the system really went wrong back in 1976 in Buckley versus Vallejo when the Supreme Court um, made three dreadful mistakes, each one of which is a body blow to democracy and combined is really um, in large part why we're where we are now. The first thing they said was spending money, large amounts of money, um, uh, to finance speech is exactly the same thing as speech. So spending money has to be treated as speech. We'll talk about this next week, about what, gets, what counts as speech or not. Um, 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 spending, the lower court said spending money was conduct. It wasn't speech. Um, uh, the Supreme Court said no, spending money is speech. And it doesn't matter how much money 
I could, I could be sympathetic with an argument that said spending a reasonable amount of, uh, a reasonable amount of money to get your message out is speech. But spending an unlimited amount of money to dominate strikes me as being um, uh, um, at least a contestable question. And to his credit, Justice Stevens never accepted that. He fought it every minute that he was on the court. Um, um, the second, uh, I think, uh, um, a serious mistake they made is they said that equality, electoral equality, trying to make everybody relatively equal in our political power, is not a strong enough argument to put a lid on how much a very, very wealthy person can pour into an election. That you can't, you can't limit the spending of the rich simply because it gives them too much power. Um, uh, they have a right under the First Amendment to spend as much as they want and can, and efforts to put an equality um, a limit on that um, are, are unconstitutional. So that was the second, uh, I think, terrible mistake. Um, it's now a staple of the Republican Constitution. My sense is it will not, it would not be a staple of the Democratic Constitution. They would recognize equality as, a nor as, a, as, an, as an adequate basis for at least limiting skyrocketing costs. And the third one, you laugh when you hear it because it's so ridiculous. The third one is corruption is a compelling interest. Stopping corruption is a compelling interest. And that means that you can limit campaign contributions. You can limit the size of campaign contributions because you're afraid that they're buying the candidate. Um, but you can't limit the size of money that somebody, um, uh, 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 the size of expenditures, of money that somebody spends allegedly independently of the candidate. So all these massive super PACs we're going that are going around now, spending huge amounts of money on the presidential election, there's no way to regulate them because the Supreme Court says nobody's going to really be too, um, uh, nobody's going to be affected by that. There can't be any corruption there. The fact that somebody spent three million dollars to get you elected doesn't mean that you're going to really care about them after you get elected. But if he tries to give you the money, that's different. So if he gives you the money, you can, uh, um, we can stop that. But if he spends the money publicly on you, we can't stop that. That's the third distinction. So you put those three distinctions together, that, that spending money is speech, that equality doesn't count, um, and that corruption can only be dealt with through dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, contributions and not expenditures. That's why the political process these days is dominated by the super PACs that are funded by extraordinarily wealthy people in both parties, by extraordinarily, well, extraordinarily wealthy people in both parties that make a mockery out of the idea that we're an equal democracy, that we all have equal voices and equal chances um, uh, in the system. Um, and the Supreme Court has made it impossible, impossible for us to pass, a regular, uh, pass anything uh, that, will, that will stop that process. Um, my belief is, based on um, uh, voting last term, um, is that the Democratic Constitution no longer endorses Buckley. That Buckley is ready to go over if the Democrats ever get a majority. As it stands now, it's, it, there's, a, there's an absolute 5-4 phalanx that makes it impossible to win one of these cases. There will be a, a five-person Republican majority. And again, it, it's where I started. Republicans for autonomy, Democrats for equality. Uh, it's, the, it's the relative difference in the value structures that they bring to the bench that ultimately drives their decision in hard cases. So where do we go? What can we do? Do we have to wait for a democratic constitution? That would be nice. Um, I was more confident that we'd have one last week than I am this week. Um, uh, but, um, um, uh, but it would be nice if we had a democratic constitution. But you don't have to wait. People like you who care who come out here to listen to something like this. You don't have to wait for a democratic constitution. There, there are things we can do right now. We can dismantle the first tier and dismantle the third tier without running into the constitutional roadblock that the Supreme Court has imposed. We can dismantle the first tier by going to public funding of elections. Uh, and, and in New York City, you've got exactly the system that works. In New York City, elections are publicly funded on what is known as a multiple match. So that if, some, if, if, I, get a, if I get a dollar in, in contributions, the city matches it at one, two, three, five, depending upon uh, a particular matching formula. And that means that I have to raise money 
I have, to, I have to be able to get supporters to say that they care enough about me to give me money in small amounts, because the only thing that's matched are small donations. So I have to get a lot of small donations, but if I get those small donations, those small donations are then um, uh, expanded to the point where I can run a viable campaign. Um, there's nothing unconstitutional about that. that. That is valid under Buckley versus Vallejo. It is valid today. And if we went to some sort of multiple matching system, um, that would overnight change uh, a lot of the complexion of American politics. The second one is tax credits. Now, the trouble, problem with tax credits is it only works for people with money who pay taxes. Um, uh, but you could have a tax credit for making a political contribution. And that means that you could make the political contribution anywhere you wanted. And you would get a credit, which would mean that, that it was being funded by the government. And the beauty of it is no government bureaucracy. The money doesn't go into the government. The government does, doesn't have to decide who gets it. You decide who gets it. And the irony is, you know what state runs a terrific tax credit program? Arkansas. We could learn a lot from Arkansas on the way they run their tax credit program. Um, third, um, we could eliminate the, um, the third tier. Why, why do we have a system of opt-in voting? where well, you have to opt in to vote. You don't have to opt in uh, to serve on juries. You don't have to opt in to, to register for the draft. You don't have to opt in to get vaccinations before you can go to school. Um, you don't have to opt in now uh, um, in terms of buying health insurance. Those are all looked at as civic duties. That, we, that you say you must do. Why isn't voting the same kind of civic duty? Um, countries all over the world make voting a civic duty. Australia, for example, has a 97% ballot turnout because it is a civic obligation in Australia to vote. Um, um, and um, the, the, why don't we do that? We know, for example, I'll give you, a, a, um, if you run a 401k program, if you're an employer running a 401k program, you know that if it's an opt-in program, your poor workers are not going to participate. Um, uh, but if you don't say you don't want to, it's an obligation. It's a civic obligation. Um, we could figure out how to enforce it in a gentle way, but it, it, is a, it, is, it would be deemed a civic obligation. If that's too Orwellian for you, if compulsory voting is too Orwellian, at least why doesn't the government assemble the registration rolls? We, we're the only democracy that forces voters to have two transaction costs. You have to first go register, and then you vote. Everywhere else, France, Britain, Germany, um, the government assembles the registration voting rolls. It's their job to do that. And then you only have to turn up once on election day. Now, if you don't want to give the government that much power, how about just saying, OK, then you can register on the day of the election. It's called same-day registration. It's the law in seven states now. And each of those seven states have seen electoral uh, participation go up by at least 10%. When they, when they have uh, same-day registration. Um, so why don't we do same-day registration? Um, and then finally, why do we vote on a weekday? It's not in the Constitution. Why do we vote on a day in which an employee has to hope that his boss is not going to get pissed off at him because he took time off to vote? Um, why don't we move voting to a weekend like it is in almost every other democracy? And I'll tell you why. And this is, this is what scares me, and I will share this with you. The reason we don't do it is deep down, we don't want poor people voting, not in large numbers. We're perfectly happy to say, it used to be we kept them out because uh, they were formally, they couldn't vote, because if you didn't have property, uh, you couldn't be trusted. Um, we can't say that anymore. It would embarrass all of us if we were to say, we don't want to have poor people vote because we don't trust their judgment. They aren't as educated as we are. They aren't as sophisticated as we are. And we should have a better, we should have more of a say in what the democracy is. And so we, we're just not going to let poor people vote. Um, my sense is, if we, didn't, if we wanted to have poor people vote, we wouldn't be running this system. We wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be running the system I've just described to you painfully over the last hour. Um, we would be running a different system. Um, and I think what we should all be doing is surfacing that issue. When somebody starts talking to you about the system, you ask them whether they believe that poor people should vote. 
And if they believe that poor people vote, should vote, this system cannot be tolerated uh, because it excludes them disproportionately in a massive way. So my sense is, regardless of the outcome of the coming election, um, uh, I, I don't care, because either I'm going to be happy at its outcome or I'm going to seek political asylum somewhere. Um, uh, uh, but uh, either the coming election will make me happy and uh, we'll be able to make some progress in the courts uh, and perhaps in the legislatures, um, or we won't. But I'll, tell, I'll, I'll say this. You owe it to your children. I owe it to my grandchildren to give them a better democracy than the democracy we have now. This is not a democracy that any of us can be, pr be proud of. And I think one of the most important tasks in American life today is to try to find ways to improve it. So, thank you. So I'll, I'll take a few questions. Please don't feel obliged to stay. I'm serious. It's a, it's a quarter to eight. The vice president, uh, the, the debate starts soon. So feel, uh, feel free to leave. But if you have questions, I'm happy to answer a couple. Uh, go up to the mic so that we can uh, get it on audio. Let's start here. Sure. Uh, on voter ID, what, what is the burden uh, for showing purpose? Would you know a sponsor of a voter ID bill have to say on the floor, uh, you know, I'm I'm passing this bill to disenfranchise people because you know even in, even that's not enough. You remember in Pennsylvania, one of the yeah. one of the guy one of the sponsors in Pennsylvania said, oh, we passed it. Um, the state is now safe for Mitt Romney. I mean, that's what he said. He said it openly, <laughs> um, uh, and we you know everybody jumped on it in the litigation. Um, the problem was they said, oh yeah, but that's just one guy. I mean, um, and this is, of course, one of the one of the maddening things when somebody says to you, "You have to prove what the legislative purpose is." Legislatures don't have purposes. Legislatures aren't things. They don't have minds. They're people, a group of people. And when you say, "What the le what's the legislative purpose?" How do you know whose legislative purpose you count to make the legislative purpose of the uh, uh, which which senator? Is it the guy that introduced it? Is the guy that spoke on the floor? Is it the marginal vote that made it possible to pass it? Is it the majority? Nobody knows. It's uh, it, um, it's uh, when you litigate a, a legislative purpose case, it's absolute analytic chaos in trying to get the judge to focus. And I don't blame him because it's a very very hard question. But that helps. I would have won the Florida case if I had some guy who had said that. But they were too smart to say it. And they're always too smart to say it. Now, you can be sure that this guy in Pennsylvania um, is still smarting from the spanking that he got after saying what he said. <laughs> um, in terms of some, the, some of the states in the country that allow voting early and allow voting, have days of voting in person before the actual election, would it be possible for a state like New York to, uh, or people in the state to sue the state because they don't allow election uh, allow voting early while other states do so there's an equality issue there maybe it's a nice it's 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 um, it's a nice question i've uh, i've heard it debated um, um, the i think there might be an equality issue and ironically the case I would cite would be Bush v. Gore. Um, um, and in fact, you know, uh, when the Obama administration, by the way, this year um, in litigation, um, the litigation has been successful in defeating every single one of the ballot suppression statutes around the country. This election will not be affected by the ballot suppression rules. They've been, they've been enjoined in every single state in which they've been passed. Um, and in the, last, in the last one, which was the Sixth Circuit, um, uh, an Ohio um, uh, 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 statute that, for, that stopped early voting and that did all sorts of things to make voting harder, uh, the Sixth Circuit affirmed an injunction that a lower court granted, and the Obama team that was making the litigation, they, they told me this funny story. They said, you know, we all wore clothespins on our noses when we argued it because our lead case was Bush v. Gore. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it won. And so, uh, so yes, it might, it might work. Um, in regards to changing the day of voting to a weekend, I know there's a lot of religious reasons why I'm for Saturday and Sunday, which is one of the reasons. Well, not both. Uh, there are, there's religions that would not permit for Sunday either. Well, 
So I was wondering, I don't know, I don't know why Tuesday became an election day, but I do know there are, you know, a religion, Tuesday. A religion that's, that, that celebrates both Saturday and Sunday. No, but there's one religion. Well, but, no, but if you allow voting well, to I'm, go I'm, for I'm, both days on the weekend, then, then well, you've Well, then done that's it. the whole thing, is it? Would it be a two-day instead of a one-day election? Oh, yeah, election? no, no. When I said voting on a weekend, I didn't, I didn't mean a single day on the weekend. I meant the whole weekend. That's what, that's what, that's what say, France does. France has voting on the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and so you vote either day. Hi. Uh, you talked a lot about um, courts that would act under a democracy prism, so for like acting in the good or like with the good of democracy in mind. But I'm curious, like, what that would look like if it's not a textual basis. What would like kind of a like what would it be based off of? Because in how you're talking about it right now, Republicans and Democrats would probably have a very different idea of what democracy or good democracy would look like. Well, that's, I mean, your question is a great question. The question is, um, if, if, some, if judges were to do what I'm asking them to do, which is to say I don't have to find some text that I'm pretending to hook my opinion to, I'm actually going to just say I'm doing it as a good democracy or a bad democracy, where would they get the standards? Um, and you should feel very proud of yourself because you're sounding like Felix Frankfurter who was one of the smartest people I, I've ever, uh, I've ever uh, read. Um, the short answer to Frankfurter is, look, judges do this all the time. There is no federalism clause in the Constitution that says this is the way you allocate power between state and federal uh, government, uh, between the state and federal government. There's no separation of powers clause in the, in the Constitution that says this is the way you allocate power to the president, this is the way you allocate power to Congress, this is the way you allocate power to the courts. In fact, Madison tried to put a separation of powers clause in the Constitution and it was taken out. Uh, they, they, they didn't want it. Um, but nevertheless, courts do a great job, pretty, uh, a pretty good job, not a great job, a pretty good job of, of um, working out good federalism rules and good separation of powers rules without textual support. Demo if, if the Constitution has pillars, the three pillars are federalism, separation of powers, and democracy. If they can do it for two of the pillars, surely they can do it for the third. Um, and the answer is, they should be deciding the cases in ways that will enhance the ability of individuals to exercise their right to engage in equal self-government. Uh, you know, you don't, it's not rocket science. They can then work out a jurisprudence. Um, um, if you took all the cases that I was talking to you about today, they would come, many of them would come out differently if you said, gee, does this help people uh, participate in democracy or does it hurt them? And, and that wouldn't be, I think that's not beyond the capacity of the very smart people I know uh, who are federal judges. Yeah, but doesn't the uh, system you just described argue against the basic structure of the Constitution? The basic structure of the Constitution, the three branches, the separation of powers, Congress has most of the power to do good, to fix things, to make things better, to uh, proceed. The president just has a veto power and executing power. So he doesn't have as much... Well, you're not going to argue that the president is weaker than Congress, are you? Well, it's the... Not no, in any country that I've ever... But he has different in. powers in terms of how we're going to do this. So a structure was created, and the judiciary was supposed to watch over the other two. How do you take your argument and fit it within the broad confines of that structure? Um, it seems to be cutting freely loose so that everybody can do good in their own way. Well, it is, it is, uh, you know, it's, it, it, there's a danger. You're giving judges a great, a uh, very significant amount of power. Um, they are exercising a very significant amount of power now, and they're exercising it poorly. And so what I'm hoping is that this will induce them to exercise the power of shaping democracy better than they've done over the last 50 years, which has not been, I think, a particularly uh, successful uh, experiment. Um, what I would urge, and it would fit into the structure by saying um, what they're doing, I mean, if, you know, if, if, if uh, the, the last refuge of a scoundrel is next week's uh, talk, which is the First Amendment, I could fit this into the First Amendment in a minute. I could say the right to vote um, is the ultimate act of expression. And the ultimate act of expression is protected by the free speech clause, and therefore judges should be developing not a, an equality-based norms, but a set of norms that guarantee you the right to express yourself through voting. And anything that gets in the way should be, should be struck down just like we strike down censorship. Um, and so, I mean, whether, would it be better than, than what we have now? I don't know.
But I can tell you this, it wouldn't be worse. <laughs> um, I'm going to take, uh, I'll, 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 oh, there are three of you. Please, feel free to leave, but, uh, but ask the questions and I'll try to do it quickly. Okay, thanks. Um, for disenfranchisement, uh, you, I, I believe you said it, it's next to impossible to prove discriminatory intent by the, the legislature. But d wasn't that the whole victory in Proposition 8? In Proposition 8, wasn't Bo Olson and Boys oh, able to, yeah. they were able to strip it down so they exposed discriminatory intent, because there's nothing, well, I mean, there's it's, nothing it, left. Well, yeah. When I say it's impossible, I don't mean to say it's never been done. Right. Um, if you're lucky enough to have the evidence, you can use it. And what I think courts often do um, is they jigger the doctrine that if they, they suspect that it's per, um, a, a bad purpose, they'll strike it down on suspicion grounds, finding some other doctrinal way to do it. Um, but as someone who has litigated a lot of these cases, let me tell you, you don't want to have to prove purpose. It is very, very hard. Very hard.